Management of the National Park Service was the topic of a hearing last week on Capitol Hill. The Park Service director testified before a House Resources Subcommittee in an hour and 10 minute hearing. Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, uh, today's hearing. Today we are here to examine the 2001 National Park Service management policies. And uh, before I begin, I want to uh, would, would welcome the National Park Service Director, Fran Manella, who's making our first appearance before the subcommittee. I'm very uh, pleased to be here, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for inviting me. If it's possible, I'd like to bring forth to sit at the table with me my Deputy Director, Randy Jones, and also my Associate for Natural, uh, Natural Resources, Mike Sukup. Not a problem. There'll be, there be no objections so order. I, I have to do that before I'll I can do this. I'll also have uh, my other deputy, uh, Don Murphy, behind me as well. And hope, but I th uh, did want to have a good, strong team here with us. Today. Super. Well, well welcome you. to the first uh, appearance before the committee. I understand it was your birthday yesterday. I yes, sir, it was. Birthday. We'll refrain from singing happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Don't ask me yeah. how old now. <laughs> I'm sure you'll appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, during the final days of the Clinton administration, the Park Service issued the new, manage the new, the new 2001 management policies, replacing those issued in 1988. And while a revision of some of the elements of the management policies have, may have been in order, indeed most of the new handbook was not changed, there are several areas in which the policy shift from previous standard is very significant and of uh, some concern. For example, the 1988 policies that state Congress's mandate to the Park Service has been expressed as conserving resources while providing for their enjoyment by today's citizens in a manner that will leave them unimpaired for future generations. It goes on to say that there will in in excuse me, inevitably be some tension between conservation and resources, conservation of resources on the one hand and public enjoyment on the other. The National Park Service is charged with the difficult task of achieving both, and this balancing act is not unusual. Congress has repeatedly required federal agencies to balance two competing principles. In fact, our nation was founded upon requirements in the Constitution to balance competing principles. I'm concerned about uh, that the new policies have discarded this balancing requirement. They appear to place the requirement uh, to conserve park resources unimpaired far above the second component of that dual mandate. That is very significant change from the direction given by Congress and, and from the policy direction relied upon by the park personnel for decades. And while nobody would argue that the Park Service does not have an important responsibility to conserve park resources, many aspects of these new policy changes will pose numerous and unforeseen management problems for the Park Service. In fact, superintendents have privately expressed to the subcommittee considerable concern about the new policies and specifically about the new interpretations of the Organic Act. Although it has only been a short time since the policies were issued, the new standards seem to open the Park Service up to considerable new legal jeopardy and unforeseen management problems. In addition, this new interpretation is inconsistent with the philosophy of balance uh, enunciated by uh, many times by both the Secretary and the President of the United States. I'm also concerned that, that the testimony submitted by the Park Service indicates that, that the policy interpreting the Organic Act was changed to comply with the federal court's direction in Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance versus Dabney. Not only was this never required by the court, but the Park Service seems to be unaware that this decision was reversed in August of 2000 and remanded back to that judge by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. In fact, the appeals court's decision notes that the balancing act required in the 1988 Park Service policies was jettisoned by the Park Service after the original decision. The appeals court record clearly demonstrates their recognition that this new interpretation is, is a substantial rewrite of long-standing recognized Park Service policy that's been in place for over 85 years. Thus, today we have a policy that was crafted to respond to judicial direction that was never given and remains in place despite the appeals court reversals. Given the fact that the Park Service conducted a substantive reassessment of the Organic Act and revised its policies as a result of this district court decision, we will expect another substantive reass reassessment of the policy revision because the decision was reversed. In addition, there are numerous other substantial changes in the management policies that need to be addressed. 
I look forward to making the case uh, that the management policies need to receive further attention and revision, and I look forward to a healthy dialogue on these issues uh, between the subcommittee and the Park Service. And uh, with that, I will uh, turn, turn my attention now to the ranking member, Mrs. Christensen, uh, for her opening statement. Donna. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I too want to join you in welcoming Sec Secretary um, Director Manella to our hearing today, and we look forward you. to your testimony. I know that I can speak for all of my colleagues on the subcommittee when I say that we appreciate the good working relationship that we have with the National Park Service, and we look forward to continuing working together to protect and preserve our national parks. And if my um, constituents are here, they'd be shocked, because we do have some thorny issues at home. <laughs> the statement still stands. Thank you. The subject of today's oversight hearing, the National Park Service Management Policies 2001, was published by the National Park Service in December of 2000. As you know, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, the document is an attempt to synthesize requirements containing the various authorities which control operation of the national park system, including the U.S. Constitution, public laws, treaties, executive orders, regulations, directives, <coughs> and others. Once compiled, management policies is considered the basic service-wide policy document of the National Park Service, and adherence to policy is mandatory unless specifically waived or modified by the secretary, the assistant secretary, or the director. It is our understanding that this most recent version of the management policies supersedes the previous edition published in 1988. While development of the management policies is an internal process, the National Park Service is to be commended on its decision to provide an opportunity for public comment, public notice and comment on this edition, not once but twice. After two comment periods, 60 days in 1998 and another 60 days in 1999, the National Park Service received approximately 125 public comments. Apparently, Chairman Hansen was among those who chose to provide input into this edition of the management policies prior to its publication. Given that this document is designed to cover literally every aspect of the national park system, we've had some difficulty, though, in determining the precise purpose of, of today's meeting. We can only assume that there are members who have some concerns regarding particular aspects of the management policies and feel that input from the new director would be useful. Such a dialogue is very appropriate, but I just wanted to make one final point in closing. The National Park Service Management Policies 2001 is simply a reflection of the law governing the National Park Service, and in our view, it is an accurate one. <coughs> It is my feeling that if the subcommittee is troubled by some aspect of the operation of the national park system, it would be better for members to seek out the relevant underlying statute rather than seeking changes in a document simply intended to synthesize them. Again, I want to join you, Mr. Chairman, in welcoming our director here today. And again, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Christensen. Are there any other um, opening statements or brief comments uh, that anybody else on the panel yes. would like to make? Um, Mr. Duncan. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for calling this hearing, and I don't have a formal or lengthy uh, opening statement. I just want to welcome, also welcome uh, Director Manella to the <coughs> subcommittee. I've heard many good things about her career and the work that she's done over the years, and, and uh, <coughs> as uh, some of you know, I represent the uh, most heavily visited national park in the whole system, uh, the Great Smoky Mountains, or I represent half of it anyway what is sometimes referred to as the quiet side of the Smokies. We have between 9 and 10 million visitors uh, each year, and I was uh, pleased that the director, uh, I think, uh, uh, made her first visit after she became director to the, uh, uh, to the other side of the Smokies. But uh, we're always pleased uh, uh, to have you there anytime you want to come, uh, uh, Director Manella. I, you know, my bias, though, uh, because I do represent half of the Smokies, is toward trying to uh, do more for the parks that we already have rather than expanding the number of parks in any big way or expanding the areas under the parks uh, uh, jurisdiction. I think we need to take better care of the parks that we already have, and that's uh, sort of where I'm coming from. But we will, we will uh, certainly be uh, looking for ways to work with you in every way possible, and we're pleased that you're here today. Thank you, Thank you very sir. much, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Souter? <laughs> 
Um, my, uh, some of my line of questioning is going to be represented in this kind of attitude, and I want to make sure I get it on the record in the beginning, is I, I visited many of the uh, parks around the country. One of the fundamental problems, which was built into the National Park Service, is this balance. But we further confused that by having all types of units in the Park Service, from recreation areas to <coughs> lake shores to uh, parks that are predominantly wilderness to uh, heritage areas where the park is partly involved to historic sites to preserves where we still have ranching. Um, and I think some of the confusion could be sorted through if it wasn't a one-size-fits-all document. And I'm going to be asking some questions along that line. So I think. Uh, okay, Chairman. thank you, Mr. Souter. Any other comments, Jim? Yeah, I just want to. Um, I want to join with my colleagues here in welcoming you, welcoming you here today. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm from Massachusetts. Is you know we, a lot of my constituents go to other states to en enjoy uh, national parks, but um, <laughs> uh, nonetheless, um, I, I have to tell you that uh, I probably get more mail on uh, the preservation of national parks and appropriate upkeep than almost any other kind of environmental, uh, any, any other environmental issue out there. Uh, and my, I think most of the people that I represent uh, believe that um, one of the thing, one important policy for uh, for you as director to uphold is that uh, when conflicts arise between um, conserving resources and providing for enjoyment, that uh, conservation uh, is takes precedence and is predominant. And uh, and so I hope um, that you will address some of that when you when you talk here today. Um, and people are very very concerned about conservation, and um, and it's an issue that I'm sure that others have asked you about, but uh, I just want to put that out on the record in the beginning. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Anybody else uh, for opening comments? Hilda? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I know that we have a lot of information we'll be hearing from you today, and my, I guess, issues are with respect to environmental areas where the National Park Service can probably play a bigger role in urban communities, particularly where underrepresented communities are, and I mean, uh, Latino and, and Asian communities. We have different uh, parks that are already dedicated to different Native American and to other uh, individuals in our history, but those communities are still not uh, a focus of any attention. And then also, uh, with respect to the 1916 Organic Act and the 1978 Amendment to the Act, uh, the Congress made clear that the National Park Service uh, would keep the parks in conditions that are unimpaired, and to see uh, what your thoughts are on that in terms of how you will continue to, to carry forth this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and a statement from uh, Mr. Gilchrist. Just briefly, um, as, as we go through this hearing and you make decisions in the months and years ahead, um, my perspective, which I think is reflected by the members here today, is to err on the side of conservation whenever there is an issue of conflict, no matter how volatile that might be, because I don't think anywhere in any of the acts that preceded us to develop the national park system has any mention that we should emphasize or give credence to a narrow um, business interest uh, for a, a group of people or um, an enterprise. But the Park Service, um, much to the thanks of Teddy Roosevelt and people like that, wanted to preserve these lands for all time uh, for people to enjoy in its natural state. And uh, we appreciate you coming here today and giving your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, before you, you begin, Director, I just want to make everybody aware of the fact that there will be some votes coming up probably at about 2.30. It looks like there could be a, uh, an amendment vote, a uh, motion to recommit, and a final passage. So there will be either two or three votes coming up at around then. Of course, we'll adjourn and come back and continue the hearing. So with that, uh, welcome, Director Manila. Thank and, you so much. Uh, you may begin your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to summarize my written statement that has been submitted to you for the record. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the opportunity to appear before this subcommittee to discuss the National Park Service management policies. Our policies play a vital role in helping us make intelligent and fair decisions about the national parks, and I welcome this opportunity to explain what the policies are, how we develop them, and how we apply them to our daily management of the national park system. 
I want to describe how we are ensuring that our park superintendents implement the changes found in the management policies in 2001 appropriately and consistently. I will also welcome the opportunity to hear any concerns you may have about how we developed and how, how we apply the current policies. The policies are guiding principles or procedures that set the framework and provide consistent direction for management decisions. Throughout our policies, we try to translate laws, regulations, executive orders, and secretarial orders in a cohesive manner that all our employees can understand and implement as intended. Second level direct uh, directives, known as director's orders, supplement our management policies, and in some cases, a third level, such as a handbook or reference manual, is required just to en encourage clarity. Congress intended and visitors expect that the parks will be managed to the highest standard of consistent and professional care. Visitors rightly expect that they have the appropriate, that, that we have appropriate opportunities to enjoy park resources and values. Management policies help bring a reasonable degree of order and discipline to the decision-making process, which is important in a dispersed organization with 385 diverse park units. Our written policies are also a means of keeping both the Congress and the public informed on how we implement the laws that govern parks. Policies provide an understanding of the ground rules by which the service manages parks. Policies to guide park manage management have been with us a long time, and many of the fundamental fundamentals have remained the same. Since uh, 1918, there have been 13 documents issued by the secretary or the director that provided guidance on the administration of the national park units. The current form, known as management policies, first appeared in 1978 and have been revised four times since then. The 2001 issue of management policies was developed through an internal effort that began in 1994 and involved extensive field review, consultation, and an opportunity for public review and comment. Most of our policies offer flexibility to deal with special circumstances. If a park manager has a compelling reason why he or she cannot comply with a particular policy, the secretary, assistant secretary, or director may grant a waiver in writing so long as the waiver is consistent with the statutory law and other higher authorities, such as the presidential proclamations and executive orders. As we looked at the revision of the management policies uh, from 1988, the addition has not ch the the policies have not changed dramatically. For example, the new addition explains in more detail the need for superintendents to be good neighbors by inviting participation in park planning and decision making. There is also more detail and emphasis on the need for scientific management of park resources so that better decisions can be made and an increased emphasis on the administrative re record which justifies the decisions made by park managers. I think one is issue of particular interest that was addressed in the 1998 uh, uh, and more fully explained uh, in the 2001 edition is the responsibility imposed on the service uh, by the no impairment clause of the 1916 National Park Service Organic Act. This issue was dealt with in greater detail primarily because of a court case involving Canyonlands National Park. The Organic Act requires the service to conserve park resources and values and provide for their enjoyment in such a manner and by such a means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. This policy in Section 1.4 of the Management Policies essentially mirrors that requirement of the law and explains that impairment is an impact that in the professional judgment of the responsible National Park Service manager would harm the integrity of park resources or values, including the opportunities that otherwise would be present for the enjoyment of these resources or values. A, sin a significant change in how the National Park Service implements the impairment standard on a case-by-case -case basis is the integration of a question regarding impairment into the environmental impact evaluation that is already performed under the National Environmental Policy Act. This is a step that strengthens the administrative record and responds to the deficiencies found by the courts. Ultimate, may I continue, sir? Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, ultimately, the decision as to whether the adverse impacts of an action reaches a threshold and becomes an impairment lies with the superintendent and also the regional director. To ensure we develop consistency in the implementation of the impairment standard, most, if not all, of the findings of impairment will be subject to the review at the national level. The science is going, excuse me, the service is going through an internal learning process as managers strive to meet their responsibilities under the policy. We are developing supplemental guidance to help all our employees better understand and implement the policy. Our planners and environmental coordinators have been instructed to monitor closely how the impairment issue is addressed in our planning and environmental documents and to coordinate with our Washington staff on any areas of uncertainty. We provide training and orientation of the no impairment policy at every level of the organization and at every opportunity. Another important safeguard is implementing this uh, in, in implementing this policy is the Secretary's Four C's program conservation through consultation, cooperation, and communications. To ensure we carry out these principles, I have asked our policy team to begin drafting a director's order that will address public participation and outreach for our management decisions. I believe that implementing the no impairment policy under the guidance of the Secretary's 4C principles will help ensure that our actions comply with the law, protect park resources, and guarantee the American public appropriate opportunities to enjoy their parks. I'd like to clarify, if I may, uh, any uh, misunderstandings that may arise from the no impairment policy. It does not mean that the service will not provide any new facilities and parks nor that we will not allow reasonable public use and enjoyment of the parks. While visitors' uses may cause impacts, we are confident that we are managing over 275 million visits a year in a manner, in a manner that leaves our national parks unimpaired and the public at large supports our efforts. While we must try to avoid impacts on parks, there are times when there is a compelling reason to develop a facility or allow an activity even though it may have an adverse impact on the park's environment. While I have been director, the policy has not been unreasonably applied. It has not brought a halt to the construction of roads, visitor centers, or other amenities to serve park visitors, nor has it curtailed visitor use and enjoyment. If the subcommittee is aware of any situation where it believes the no impairment policy has led to an inappropriate decision, I would be pleased to review it and avoid any, any misapplication of the policy. One area that may lead to confusion is the distinction between appropriate uses and the impairment re of resources. The term appropriate use is key to the way we manage and enjoy the, uh, have enjoyment of the national park system. We are constantly educating our superintendents or other um, appropriate individuals about appropriate use versus impairment because they are different. National parks belong to all Americans. All Americans should feel welcome to experience the parks. Visitors to the national park system today continue to enjoy a wide range of recreational activities where appropriate and as determined by legislation or a unit's general management plan. These activities include biking, wildlife viewing, boating, canoeing, sailing, personal watercraft, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, fishing, golfing, hiking, horseback riding, mountain climbing, off-road vehicle use, orienteering, orienteering, excuse me, rock climbing, scuba diving, snowmobiling, and swimming. We in the National Park Service appreciate Congress's past reminders that the enjoyment of parks today must not be at the expense of future generations. However, we also understand that some of the concerns of the committee uh, members have regarding the current management policies. With respect to the no impairment standard, we are developing supplemental guidance, expanding our training and orientation programs, reviewing our impairment findings at the national level, and keeping a better administrative record on all decisions. In addition, for all management decisions, we will be developing policy guidelines on public participation and outreach. With your help, the service will ensure that we today and our children tomorrow continue to enjoy the same quality of the natural and cultural and splendid uh, scenic uh, opportunities of our national park system. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to provide you with this background information and giving me the extended time to do so. This concludes my prepared remarks, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director. As you know, those were those bells were the vote calls, and we've yes, probably sir. got another five minutes at least before we should should head out. If uh, if if it's okay with the committee, shall we adjourn and uh, and uh, and readjourn or recess and, and return to this uh, after the last vote? If members who are interested uh, to give questions and have some dialogue, please do your best to get back here right after the vote. Thank you. We're, we'll be in recess. Until Thank the you. Are finished. Thanks. Welcome uh, again. This uh, meeting is uh, hearing is back in session, and um, I think I'll go ahead and start off with a, a, a few questions, Fran. Yes, sir. I know that um, if I can kind of uh, go over my knowledge of the history, of the development of these plans, um, and it, it seems to me as they re relate to the issue of impairment and the definition of impairment, seems to have changed in this plan as a result of of a lawsuit. Um, I forget the date of the lawsuit, but it was it was 1998. Um, S U W A versus the National Park Service, um, Southern Utah Wilderness Association, I believe, um, and it raised the impairment standard as predominant as the predominant mission of the Park Service. Uh, tipping 82 years of balancing resources protection and, and visitor enjoyment, and it seems to kind of strike at the heart of this whole issue of of the idea that the Park Service and the Organic Act was formed to, to uh, achieve a balance between um, uh, conservation and, and access or, or enjoyment of the resources. And yet, uh, in, a, in a decision in 1998, in this court decision, at least the court seemed to prioritize one, one purpose above the other. Uh, giving the issue of the protection of the resources over the visitorship of the of this particular wilderness area, and uh, and it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that that was the decision which led to the formulation of some of the management policies that were that were have seen adopted here today. Now, um, it was my to my knowledge, uh, this thing in '99. Uh, was thrown out of court, and uh, I, I think the, the court had remanded in, a, in appeal that, um, uh, that 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 finding was not right, and that the Organic Act was was uh, uh, written to stress the fact that that it, this, it is a balancing act that we're looking at. It's not one uh, use over the other. Can you kind of? go through that for me, to kind of lay it out a little bit? I'd be glad to. As best as I can, again, I wasn't here during that time, right. as you know, but my understanding through my briefings and, all, uh, and my reading of materials is that always, um, the, you know, in all honesty, if you go back to reading the 1916 Organic Act, as I read it, it always has been existing that the enjoyment was always under the contingency of the fact that the uh, it had to be that the resources were still always protected or go un, uh, unimpaired. And so that was always like a modifying factor so that that has always existed. And being in public lands management as long as I have, we've always, uh, you know, my comment has always been, for those who have known me in Florida and others, is that there can be no outdoor recreation without protection of the resource first. And if you're going to err, you will err on the side of the resource. And so we've always been in that position. I think what happened in these court cases, as I've been briefed, and we do not have our solicitors with us here today, I apologize on that, uh, that the, the court 
uh, the tenth uh, Utah, I mean the uh, the uh, district uh, court out of Utah, actually found us in violation not of policy but truly of the Organic Act, mm -hmm. and that was the first time in our history that we know of that we've actually been found guilty of of that. And then there was an appeal, and then in the appeal. The appeal, uh, the, the uh, decision was reversed, but it was remanded back to the, dis to the uh, district court to look at it again. And through the explanations that I've been given was because of the fact that uh, we were not clear. We, did, we were working on policies, and it did at that point, even though they've been working on policies, National Park Service, since 1994, it gave us an extra um, impetus to emphasize clarity in the impairment aspect so that it wasn't a court deciding what impairment was, but actually done through professionals in park and recreation to uh, help define that. And the only thing I have on the actual court review is that I've got here a quote. Um, it says, the appeals court also wrote that we read the act as permitting the National Park Service to balance the sometimes conflicting policies of resource conservation and visitor enjoyment in determining what activities should be per permitted or prohibited. But the court added that the test for whether the National Park Service has performed its balancing properly is whether the resulting action leaves the resources unimpaired for the enjoyment of future uh, generations. That's what the appeal court said when it reversed but sent it back to um, the, dis uh, to the uh, uh, district level of court. So uh, at this point, um, I, you know, and I don't know if I can go further knowing more about that, uh, and I would look to either Randy or, or Mike if they have any follow-up, uh, but again, I'd have to pull my solicitors in and I could have them do some more write-up on it, but that's as much as I would be able to speak to, I think, in regard to uh, what was taking place. But I know that the, again, always, as you look at it, you're always doing a balancing, but the your airing always has to be inside of the resource. and by law, as we were found guilty of in the original uh, case, but again, it was reversed, was that we were actually violating the Organic Act when we were trying to actually allow some access into the backcountry area. Uh, we, were, we thought we were restricting it, but permitting it, uh, some access, and we thought uh, that we were not in violation of any Organic Act. And uh, as we go through, I think we're still working on an uh, uh, environmental assessment uh, in that area, and in doing that, uh, we would uh, probably be looking at some kind of access back there again if we if the courts will allow us. Right, um, and, and just for the uh, entering into the record, I, uh, there's a decision, as you are well aware, uh, that dealt with in, you know, in my, well, I like to say my park, Yosemite National Park, right. park within my district, uh, that where they, uh, the, the lawsuit uh, resulted in a court decision which basically uh, um, spoke to the issue of the Organic Act, and I'd like to read it into the record. Um, uh, which kind of reinforces the, the issue of balancing right. uh, as the approach. Uh, the Organic Act commits the National Park Service the protection and furtherance of two fundamentally competing values, the preservation of natural and cultural resources and the facilitation of public use and enjoyment. These competing values of conservation and public use have been actively in conflict since before the establishment of the National Park Service, and the Organic Act did not resolve the conflict in favor of one side or the other. Rather, the Organic Act acknowledges the conflict and, saying nothing about how to achieve resolution, grants deference to the National Park Service in balancing the competing and conflicting values. Uh, this was in the case of Sierra Club versus Babbitt that was, of course, recently, uh, uh, this judgment was recent, uh, recently issued. Uh, my concern is is that if if there is an heir to one side or the other, in particular, in uh, on the issue of impairment and and the conservation of the resources, not that I don't want to see them con conserved, right. but once you go down that road, then it, then it's very subjective as to whose interpretation of impairment is going to be used. I mean, I could make the case that that uh, if you wanted to. Um, uh, uh, in, in Yosemite, they'll be uh, developing a cultural center for, for Indians and uh, the in Native American community in the park, and they're going to disturb a, a couple blades of grass. Well, I could make the case that that, that would uh, affect the impairment of, of the national park, and, and you could go to some real extremes with that, which if you go down that road, I'm very concerned that what you, you may end up with are plans that deny access to, to parks.
I think one of the things we're working on fairly aggressively right now, and it was in my comments, is, and they actually started before I had come there, is working on some, trying to get some guidelines for our superintendents to, and, and for all of us to better understand the difference between impacts, which are allowable, and in fact, uh, we don't always we don't encourage them, obviously, but impacts are allowable, and they don't cross that line and become uh, in, in impairments until they're very severe. They deal with a major establishing legislation of the park, or dealing with the key, the key resources of that uh, of that park, or go against something that's a, co a key uh, goal established in the management plan that has been reviewed through the public uh, review and that that process. And those are the things that I think are, we're trying to actually through since I've come on board try to help give more consistency and these guidelines are going to be critical as well as uh, I do believe that the director's order might I, I, it's a timely for me to come forward with a director's order on public participation and making sure it's clear that public are invited into our parks I think mm -hmm. sometimes there were many uh, pieces of legislation, some issues that took place, not necessarily legislation, that came out simultaneous with the management policies, personal watercraft issues, snowmobile issues, and others that may have also confused, put confusion of this impact and impairment and other things, as well as just managerial decisions. My guess is a lot of things that uh, some of our members, uh, some of the members here of this committee will encounter is that uh, the appropriate use uh, of uh, what is an appropriate use in a park. Uh, for example, um, I give the example of, uh, you know, it's okay to go to the mall and have uh, a boom box, for example, you know, playing music and out there. But if to do that at the um, USS Arizona, that's a sacred, I mean, it's a, a it's a quiet. Pl that's an inappropriate. There's where th the same activity is okay one place, but not in the other. Right, right. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask about any a process that might take place from now on, because the development of this man, the, this document has been about ten, more than ten years in the making. And it's, um, there must be an interim process for altering or updating it, short of a complete revision. And if so, can you describe for us that process? And if, if you have used it, maybe an example of where you've used it already. Well, for uh, what we would be looking at doing, this, we, again, it's an administrative, um, it's not a regulation, it's, it's done through, um, you know, for coming from from the department, and it is evolving. In fact, uh, if you look at uh, some of the uh, language on soundscapes and other things, that is still evolving. Mike Sukup's here and could even speak to that as we go forth. But and so, what we'll be able to do is work with that as we see of and uh, you know, where we need to further clarify. We'll be able to do that through. We'll make sure it's through a good public review. But also, I can do director's orders. You've heard me speak about director's orders, for example, to further clarify what is the intent of the, where it may be very general in a policy, be able to do a director's order that gives more clarity. And the importance is so that our, our folks in all, uh, everyone knows exactly what we're looking at and we are able to establish much more consistency throughout, uh, this, um, throughout the system. I, I hope that answers the question. Um, let's see. Um, seems like there's been a lot written in the papers recently about park service, monuments, etc. And this morning we had um, a meeting that looked at some public opinion polls. And whatever you feel about polls, they do give us an idea where the people we serve stand on issues. And it, these indicated that most Americans are really concerned about the protection of our open spaces, our parks, and want stronger laws, or m really mostly they want to see that the laws are strictly enforced. 
um, those that are on the books are strictly enforced. And I just wanted some assurance that that was, is that the position of the Park Service? Well, they any feel that they're not being. Okay, I, I, we hope that we're doing a, a fine job in enforcing what rules we have on the books. Obviously, again, education is a key element, and we continue to, uh, I'll be emphasizing education of our employees at a greater level than probably we've ever done before, and making sure, even if we're not law enforcement officers that are out there, because enforcement can happen without being law enforcement officers, to make sure we are following through on all the guidance that is uh, uh, set forth. Randy, I don't know if you have any follow-up as having uh, Randy Jones, who's now my deputy, is uh, has been a superintendent most recently at Rocky Mountain National Park. And and, and before you answer, it, it, there seems to be the impression based on, on, on these surveys that uh, as many of 80 percent, as 80 percent of the respondents feeling that the, the enforcement of the laws or the status of the laws was just not strong enough. And, and I'm, you know, we hadn't seen that survey, I know myself, because I know we have a 95% satisfaction level in the surveys we've done on our visitations of parks, but I'm, I'm not familiar. Have, did you feel that you had uh, good lawn? Uh, we, I've certainly not uh, experienced any uh, of that kind of expression in the years I was at Rocky Mountain National Park, for example. Uh, I think a lot of the issues we deal with, uh, especially the whole public use uh, versus resource protection, is an issue of competing values and is an issue of balancing that different segments of the public come and emphasize uh, one position uh, versus another. Uh, on that issue, I've always felt, though, that uh, for the best way to protect parks for the long haul, looking to future generations, is that the parks need to be, remain relevant to society. And the best way of doing that is to have the parks uh, open and available for public use and have the public have a great time in the parks. And I think the visitation shows that that's happening. I, I think it probably goes back to the impairment issue and, and the always erring on the side of, of conservation. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably where some of the concern is. I have uh, probably one other question in this round. Um, and it goes back to uh, something Mr. Sauter said. Uh, the Organic Act um, establishing the Park Service says that these areas in describing the parks, though distinct in character, are intended, are united through the inter interrelated purposes and resources into one national park system as cumulative expressions of a single national heritage. Now, to me that sounds as though it says it's one park system. Uh, what I, how I interpret that is that there's one management or a set of concrete principles that govern the management of all parks, regardless of where they are, what kind of parks they are. And I wanted to know if that was the interpretation of the Park Service. We do view ourselves as one national park system. And through the policies, what we were hoping, I think, as they, as they were being worked on, was to help make us more consistent across the system. But to do so still on a case-by-case -case basis in the sense that we have core values, core questions that are asked uh, through when you're evaluating is this an appropriate use, is this impairment, that there are certain questions that a superintendent will ask no matter whether they're at a recreation area or whether they're at a, um, uh, at a preserve or different aspects. And of course the enabling legislation though may have established certain unique rights of, for example, Big Cypress having hunting allowed in the park where in that in that particular area or some others that allow certain establishments of certain activities that may not be consistent with the rest of the with the rest of the system. So there are parks that have hunting in the parks? There yes. are they're not under they're under the generic name of park and I think that goes back to uh, the confusion that sometimes exists but they in Big Cypress of course it's labeled as a preserve. Randy you may have okay. a follow up. Uh, the National Park System certainly has evolved uh, since 1872 when Yellowstone was first established and you know, up until really the 1950s and 60s most of the national parks were the, the big western areas, the Grand Canyons, the Yellowstones or the great historic areas like the Statue of Liberty or Gettysburg. But with, in the 60s and the 70s continuing through today there have been the whole addition of seashores, lake shores, recreation areas, urban recreation areas. Uh, the National Preserve uh, concept was actually developed 
developed by this committee in 1974, which was a recognition that there are some places on the national park system where hunting, in fact, is appropriate and is allowed in the statutes establishing those areas. And since then, we now have preserves all over the country. Uh, and then most recently, of course, with the designation of heritage areas that we're involved in that are a totally different concept. And so one of the challenges uh, we have and one of the education challenges we have with our employees that move around the service is we have to have guiding overreaching principles for the national park system. But in fact, one size does not fit all because the statutes establishing the different areas are different and what's appropriate uh, uh, at Lake Mead may not be appropriate at Yellowstone or Grand Canyon. That sounds like that invites a lot of confusion. My, my time is up. I'll come back on the next round. Okay, Mr. Souter. Thank you, and I would like to continue on this, uh, this vein. Uh, my sense, and I'm, I've just skimmed this report, is, is that, um, that this doesn't pick up the, those inconsistencies. This, um, and what I'm wondering is why a, a policy document wouldn't have, say, this is the minimalist standard for, our, for everybody, and then it's almost a gradation of uses up towards wilderness, because that's in fact how you're functioning. And some of it's by law, some of it's by practicality. Let me illustrate with a question. Um, one of the, the core debates here uh, in almost every park is should there be no net degradation of natural resources, mm -hmm. almost like our wetland standard. Um, that's been kind of the case in most of the big western parks on lodging, on campsites, on other questions like that. Is that something that you kind of view as, as a policy, no net degradation? I guess what I think is consistent, there's, and, and Mike may be able to help me in a minute, is that, of course, there's no, in none of our parks, be it you know, recreation areas or otherwise, should there be any impairment taking place. What does happen though, and the determination gets a little more. Uh, this is where the you know the where you know a recreation area is allowed to have by its exist by its establishment its, its uh, legislation usually allows more uh, recreation activities that's acceptable without crossing into where it might be even viewed as an impact. Mm -hmm. And I think in the past years they may have looked at, well, should we do by classifications different levels of activities? My own experience beyond even the national park system is that we have always tried to set certain questions, which is what has come out in the policies, to look at every area, but always going back again to the enabling legislation and the descriptions. Many of us, in when I was in state parks, looked at it as um, classifications of units to decide that. And Mike, I don't know if you have a follow-up or whether you, uh, on that. Yeah, I just might add to that. It's that Mike Suka. Um, uh, that the uh, General Authorities Act of 1970 said that we ought to have uh, essentially what you suggest, and that's that baseline minimal standards uh, for all units, no matter what their designation might be. Uh, while observing the uh, intent of the legislation, which is often quite detailed about what should go on in that park, what should be grandfathered in, and, and uh, how that park should be managed for, in some cases, increased recreational uses or certain kinds of special things that, that uh, historically occurred there. So with that policy document that, that you have there, I, in my mind, that is kind of the basic standard by which all units will be managed taking into account what um, is in the enabling legislation in terms of special things that, that might happen there? Because, um, uh, let me go through some specific examples, that that what you're basically suggesting is, is that while there might, you're using the term impairment as opposed mm -hmm. to degradation, right. um, that... Um, Both of they have the same. Yeah, when, <laughs> when, the, when the rubber meets the road in these different conflicts, because there is uh, I would argue it's day-to-day -day functioning that way, but because we kind of talk about what was grandfathered in, the, the bias moves towards uh, restricting visitation or activities type things as opposed to resource protection, which is not necessarily bad as long as you know exactly what you're doing. And I would argue right now it's a random pattern, which is what's partly causing the conflict. Let me give you some examples. We just passed Fort Clatsop legislation earlier this week. 
that will be a net degradation of a natural resource because right now it's a forest and we're going to put a trail through. That's the point of the park, is to have a trail that goes from Fort Clatsop to the ocean. Right. On the other hand, as opposed to having it as a housing development, mm -hmm. that's not a degradation. Mm -hmm. um, that, um, uh, so depending even on how you define that, that, that uh, at Elkhorn Ranch, that trying to add to Theodore Roosevelt, mm -hmm. there it would be a preserve. That would be an argument that it's grandfathered in, c conceivably, but right now some of that area isn't used that way but it was a historic use a long time ago at rocky mountain we visited the, a, a ranch that you're working to preserve uh, at each of these parks what's the battle between cultural resources and natural resources do you keep every ranch there at, at grand teton every ranch at rocky mountain um that I, I you know one of the fundamental things here is is that that we have two different, even in the historic preservation versus the natural preservation, yet alone the visitor utilization question comes into conflict as it did at Gettysburg. Another, uh, another fundamental question is, is I would argue that some of the parks are designed by nature to be conservation oriented. In other words, the very thing that Mather first put in, the, the dilemma that everybody's wrestling with ever since of visitation and preservation, Everglades, predominantly is a natural resource uh -huh. with some visitation, whereas a uh, Lake Mead was a dam, and it, wasn't, it didn't even have either as its first goal, right. and now it's, it's predominantly oriented towards visitation with some use of, of that. Even lake shores differ. When we cut the Indiana Dunes out of a Gary, Indiana and in Chicago, it's different than the lake shore at Cape Hatteras, which is different than the lake shore at Sleeping Bear uh, in Michigan, where you just had, had a few people. So what, what to me seems, just as a, a, a business guy, that there is a hierarchy here that says the more pristine the wilderness, the more you move it towards the wilderness standard. We have a hierarchy. Golden Gate is one of the more controversial because there we have added multiple types of units and there needs to be some recognition that if part of a recreation area, which I would argue the primary goal of a recreation area has recreation in its title, that if it's going to have to move more towards a park status, then it ought to be filed towards park. And if a park is going to move towards wilderness status, we ought to recognize that part of that's going towards wilderness. Informally, you're doing this, but but it's part of the conflicts that we're having is, is that it's informal rather than in a, a guideline uh, document. And then we have the whole question of obviously a park is different than a forest. And what we are continuing to see on BLM and forest land is visitor services, when possible, are located at the access to a wilderness park, if possible. But, but there needs to be kind of a, uh, a holistic, more specified gradation thing because what I don't sense out of here is the conflicts we're having on snowmobiles, personal watercraft, horseback riding, uh, cultural versus historic preservation. Uh, you're, you're trying to reach that goal, but part of it by having it say it's a park, I would, I would argue that you've gone beyond the minimal standards um, in the document and argued that the reason you've gone beyond the minimal standards is they were grandfathered in, when in fact some of these things are continuing questions. Uh, for example, uh, if I can throw one more concept out and then I'll, I'll be quiet. Uh, that, that in the, that part of what there's a general feeling right now is, is that the number of campsites, the, num the amount of lodging, the number of trails are gonna be permanently frozen at say the year 2000 and that our, our lodging, trails, and other facilities, if it's not a wilderness-designated part of a park, is it meant to be a percentage visitation, or is it meant to be a capped amount? And that is a fundamental resolution that hasn't really come forth uh, as to how we're gonna use, use these parks, because clearly demand for the parks is gonna increase over time. And does that mean that was my no net degradation? It is a fundamental uh, debate that each superintendent is floundering around with and whoever has the biggest pressure group at, a at the time or whoever is screaming loud, the whole thing on the community support, if the bedroom community gets mad enough, if there, there's enough powerful visitors to change something on one side or the other or one administration has a change, but I think that this, this document has to kind of grasp some of these and put in how, how do recreation areas evolve?
or do they? Um, because we have mixed recreation. How the lake shores? What is the Boston Island Park area? There, you improve it if you if you put in a picnic grounds as opposed to Logan Airport. Right. Exactly. I'm not I, proposing getting rid of Logan Airport, by the way. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, again, I appreciate your comments, and I think those are something that again I keep going back to. I think these policies as it's been depicted to me and when as i read them we're trying to start to make a you know a a, a method of some some more consistency in decision making and to uh, look be able to find questions more definitively to be asking and looking at so you're not doing as you're indicating where there are different pressure groups or whatever also hopefully uh, the management plan process is also an important part of trying to determine how we move forward with a particular park. And again, it does encourage public participation because I do believe that that is something that's important, but it also does so in a way, again, trying to re reiterate the, the issues that come back to making sure things aren't impaired, but also to make sure that we still have environmentally friendly access that is appropriate and, and make sure people know that they're welcome. I really would appreciate uh, maybe get a chance to visit with you at another time to get more thoughts on some of this because as, again, we see some involved, you know, I see some uh, evolving issues that are going to come forth as we, again, these have only been in place. This was only printed in March of 01. So a lot of folks, you know, uh, even though it was on the internet probably a few months before, uh, are really just uh, going and working with it. It was still so new, and I think that we're going to need to let ourselves um, uh, evolve, train employees as we go forth, but also have them encourage us, as you are, to think about some of the challenges that lay before us that we may not have yet addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director Manella, I, I know that uh, I, I, there was, on the issue of the the plan as it addresses the distinction between impact and impairment. Is it safe to say that it's left solely to the discretion of that particular park superintendent to determine that? or They are to make the recommendation to us and then the regional director has to sign off if it's an impairment. Also, what we have found, because most impairments involve the NEPA process, it means it all comes all the way usually to our Washington office to oversee that as well. So there's more uh, involvement but one of the things I think I mentioned in our my comments is that I'm going to be asking for more uh, record keeping uh, so that I have a better handle because I think you probably can list some uh, some places and areas that I'm not yet familiar with that are having some issues that may either be appropriate use discussions or dealing with um, impacts or it may be impairment but to have a better um, uh, understanding yet of what is going on again I apologize again I you know I'm excited about being in this position but I you know having only been here for probably just about I'm in my eighth month now uh, that I um, would want to continue to monitor this some more and have a little more data for you as we go through because I don't think we still have collected up all that we could uh, to better help us understand some of the scenarios <clears throat> that are out there that we need to be looking at um, Director, you had mentioned uh, the, uh, during the course of this thing, too, the, the uh, possibility of reviewing doc the documents, um, uh, taking a second look. Um, can you tell me that, if you can give me an idea of, of what's the intention, I think, from here, on, here forward, especially in the, with the idea that, that a lot of this was based on a Canyonland decision that was, that was reversed. Um, should we, could, would we consider this to be uh, perhaps the intent to substantive, uh, to provide substantive review of the policies or uh, that would lead to rewrite or give me an idea of, of what the level of right. review that you intend what to I'd do. like to do I'd rather not be rewriting the do, the policies at, at this point I'd rather continue to to monitor them and let us uh, let them continue to evolve there's going to be places that we're going to want to what I would use the word tweak I guess or mm -hmm. modify as we go along because we're going to be learning uh, some of the things that as we as we move on this but I think that with a 
again, I would ask your, uh, your support to allow me to have some time to continue to monitor, talk about the director's uh, uh, you know, uh, order to talk about public participation. Let us also get back to you from the court, uh, based on your opening comments, to get a better <coughs> understanding of uh, the court case and making sure with our solicitors, I think you mentioned about uh, whether um, we need to, uh, uh, you know, it, you know, should the should a briefing be, you know, it talked a little, maybe a little bit about whether a briefing changes or anything like that should take place, or, or maybe some thoughts on that. We just need to make sure that we have had enough uh, time to look at these, and I'd like to work again through clarifying maybe what's in the policies rather than looking at a rewrite if I can do so at this time. Right. Right. Um, I'm, I'm aware of the, uh, on this particular lawsuit that we were talking about that was remanded back to the court, that the court is still going to be making a decision. Uh, I, I guess I, I have a bit of a concern if the court uses these documents to justify any type of a decision, may influence the decision incorrectly. Uh, it, 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 are we looking at the possibility of a suspension of these documents in the meantime to protect uh, uh, how they might be interpreted in cases that may come down between now and, uh, and when, when these policies might be clarified or changed? The only things that I would look, I really wouldn't recommend at this point, but uh, to do a suspension of these documents, what I would suggest is that we go back and talk with our solicitors. I've not seen even the brief that they sent back, um, you know, that was in, you know, exactly what that indicated as far as uh, the courts, and we can ask our, because uh, Department of Justice is also involved, obviously, in this, in the in the court case, to, to give you a further update and to make sure that, again, um, I would like to continue to move forward on this, and the brief itself um, may, it may be something that can be looked at, I don't know, uh, but that is something that I would, I'd rather keep moving forward with these policies if we can for at least a period of time to be able to review them and monitor them, but ask that our solicitors uh, and the Department of Justice, I'll go back and ask them to give us a further update as far as this court case is concerned. Okay, I'm wondering if, if we can't do that in a written way that, that can express, um, I'm not sure how to do it, but but my concern is how, how a court might might use a document that's been adopted already right. in, the, in determining the, their, their decision, whereas if, if, if it's going to be tweaked or changed or, or clarified uh, in a manner not consistent with the document right. now, I'd hate to see that court right. ruling on it. Right. Uh, it, it. Maybe I should ask the question of you and you get back to right. me on, on if, if there is going to be uh, a substantive change to the document uh, that, that we should be or, or the possibility that that, mm -hmm. that, po that 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 it's possible that that could happen, right. then uh, if we can get it down on, in a written correspondence between right. you and I, I think right. that that might help uh, on any pending right. court issue. I think again, though, I don't know of whether these would change in their. I mean, the I, I guess it, it, the impairment aspect is really uh, trying to define itself as again the fact that. We shouldn't be impairing our resources, and whether that interpretation uh, is clear enough or whether that is giving any missed signals to the courts, we, that's what I think I'd like to take back and talk to the um, solicitors about and then co confer with you. Okay. Thank you. And, and to your knowledge as the Park Service, if, if there's a balancing act between uh, conservation and mm -hmm. visitorship or however you want to say right. this thing, have, have they ever uh, erred on the side of visitorship? Has this been, you're, you're talking about a balancing act, I'm sure this time's I'm when... You know, I'm sure that, uh, I don't know the history, you know, I'm sure we would find examples where we may have erred on the side of, um, uh, of the recreation, but may have come back and decided uh, again that we needed to go back. The, you know, I, the, the erring on the side of the resource, that is the permanent aspect that is, and again, even going outside National Park Service, if you talk to public land managers, the resource, the cultural and natural resources, what is not rep ever replaceable? We want to in invite the public to an environmentally friendly access, but we do do not want to do it at the uh, at the cost of uh, permanent loss to our resource on a level of impairment. Which which I not to, would not want to see it. In, right. uh, I don't uh, think you would either. A resource impaired in any way. Right. But my my concern is the the air then leads to lawsuits by special interest groups right. who would rather have nobody in the parks and blah 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 that's the way the agenda goes so and again that's the big fear that I have uh, with access to the national parks um, mrs. Christensen 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to follow up on that, I, well, I have at least six cases here. I don't know that this exhausts all of the cases um, on, um, that would go back to the issue of erring on the side of conservation, but all of, all of these, I'm informed, do that and support uh, the balancing in favor of preservation over development. But this may not be all of them. And I wanted to also go back to um, the different standards and gradations because um, it's my information that back in 1978, um, Congress, seeing the, the problem created around different standards and gradations for parks around the country, determined. It, it, legislated that there should be one standard for all parks. And um, that except for very super, superficial differences in management, that it's only when Congress specifies that there are different, should be a different management um, standard for a park that that should occur. That, that's correct? That's the way I understand it for the most part, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know Congress others. does have to specify, otherwise they're all managed basically the same except for some very, very superficial. Well, based on your resources, you know, where, where you can do hiking, where maybe somebody place else you can't, so yeah, thank you. Okay. I wanted to take the opportunity to just mention some um, issues that relate specifically to my district briefly. Yes. Um, one is our fee demo program. Yes, ma'am. And we're already halfway through the year. I'm not sure I'm going to get a chance to, to have you here again before we, we complete the year. So uh, we have a fee demo program. Uh, they're called user fees. They're not really um, termed admission fees. But given the fact that uh, two-thirds of the island of St. John is national park and that there's a conflict in the legislation which established the park, which prohibited the charging of fees for entrance to admission to the park to Virgin Islands residents. I, I'm not asking for uh, interpretation right now. I'm just asking for your commitment to work with us to see if we can find a way to, since, it, since this is just a demo program, since the legislation that transferred this land to the park did so state, to work out some arrangement that could be more palatable to the people of, the Vir of, of St. John and the Virgin Islands, especially since there are so many other issues that just cannot be changed because park service management has to be uniform throughout the parks. I'd be glad to work with It'd you, ma'am. A good uh, gesture of goodwill. And, and the other one, I, again, I, I, Something else that, you know, I'd just like to get some commitment on behalf of the people of, of, of the Virgin Islands, particularly St. Croix and St. John again, um, that as the monuments uh, issue is determined, we, we would anticipate the GAO will be answering us shortly, that um, we will be able to have a, that the Park Service will conduct a public education campaign. Uh, mainly to help us inform my constituents as to the benefits of the monument, which they're not too sure about right now, <laughs> um, and uh, that there would be an appropriate period for decision making as well. Yes, ma'am. And the, the other thing that we would like to consider and, and discuss further is whether if there is economic injury that there would be some kind of compensation. But particularly I want the comment, the public education period and the uh, I know the public education we, and all will and be at work with you. Right, decision, the management decision. consultation. That's correct. We appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I don't know that I have another pressing question right now. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Christensen. Um, I've got one one final question, uh, Director. On these, on the new policies that yes. were that, that have been submitted to the committee, do you consider these to be interpretive rules? There, as I look at the policies, we're going to be helping interp, you know, in other words, we will, they give us the general overview. We are now going to be looking at guidelines. I think I mentioned we're working, we have work groups working on guidelines to be more succinct in interpreting those particular um, policies. So I, I guess they're, they're more 
they're much more generalistic, but they actually uh, hopefully will help keep us so that they have a little more uh, substance to them than uh, what will mean that where we were found on that first court case to find that we were not even addressing uh, the Organic Act in a proper way. So we're trying to be more consistent, try to give um, some general guidelines to our, our to to our staff, but then we will need to go into more detail in uh, through guidelines and others to be, uh, and I think that's what will really play in where we can work with you on some of those and take a look at how we proceed on that. Terrific. And um, do we have an idea of how, how this, when we might see you again to discuss these? Uh, I'm always available, you sure. know, to you whenever, but I know the committee has been working on some of these guidelines for a, uh, uh, for a while, and uh, I think they're trying to try to pick up the pace. Uh, we've asked that the committee uh, pick up the pace and uh, try to do something in the next number of months. Uh, so I can give you a more realistic time frame very shortly. Very good. Uh, but we will be working on that. Very good. Um, uh, and I, I guess I'm asking unanimous consent that there be no objection that any questions that any might, uh, any committee member might have to submit, submit to the director. Thank you, sir. Uh, that they be allowed to do so in, in written form. Thank It'd you. Be wonderful. Um, Mr. Jones, Mr. Sukup, thank you for your great assist work. Mr. Chairman. And uh, Director Manella, it's been thank wonderful you. to have you before our committee. Thank and, you. Thank uh, you, sir. Uh, certainly look forward to working with you on these and many, many more issues. Thank you, sir. I do appreciate it. Oh. Thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Just ahead, a program from our American Writers series focusing on John Steinbeck. Then at 12.30 p.m.